Back in 2005, when the Airbus was first flown, I was running that company called Hummingbird, and we did three of those four biggest deals. And what I found in running a software company, uh, we were really trying to target large, enterprise, complex selling environments. And what I found was that all of the salespeople that worked for me certainly understood that sales success is largely derived from having the right relationships with people. And they also talk about strategy, but when you quiz a salesperson about strategy, they're kind of like a deer in the headlights. I don't know about you, but if a salesperson comes to me and says the deal's strategic, I need to talk to you about it, that's code to me for we need to discount the hell out of this so we're not going to sell anything for 18 months, but I want the organisation to invest heavily in pursuing it. That's usually what strategic means. But they don't really know what a good strategy is. Most salespeople just know a direct head-to-head -head strategy where they're going to behave on the basis that we have best brand, best technology, best reputation, best price, best service, best support, and we can just duke it out with the competition based on our superiority. They don't understand that there's other uh, strategies that you can employ, strategies of changing the rules, strategies of containment, different things that you can do when you sell. And when I was trying to coach and mentor salespeople into executing well, the first thing I did was try to get them to use our tools well. And, you know, Miller Hyman, I'm a huge fan of. That's basically how I met Michael Light years ago. Miller Hyman tools are fantastic. But just having a tool doesn't mean the person's going to use it well. Just having a tool doesn't mean that the information in the document is going to be able to deliver insight because often that information is inaccurate. Often you beat people up in doing account plans and using these tools and you assemble groups of people to have meetings and do peer reviews and yet when you turn your back, things just return back to how they were and the tools gather dust. So I believe in all methodologies, whether it's TAS, uh, whether it's Huthwaite's value selling, whether it's Miller Hyman's blue sheets, green sheets, gold sheets, they're great. The trick is to get somebody to use something well. And the view that I formed is it's the way a salesperson thinks and operates that determines their success, not the tools they use. And what I came up with was a framework for professional selling that actually solved this problem predominantly of strategy because, you know, strategy is like a person standing at a golf hole. You know, they plan out what they're going to do, but they can't actually hit the ball is the real problem. So you've got to have something that's executable, a strategy that's executable. And last year, I actually talked about this concept of, you know, we want salespeople to function in that top right-hand quadrant. We use these terms of sort of hunters, which would be in the top left-hand quadrant, and farmers or relationship managers on that bottom right-hand side. Transactional people more in the retail industry, you know, but what really defines being strategic? And when I interview a salesperson and ask them, I never got a good answer. And to me, being strategic absolutely first and foremost means, as Jonathan was saying today and also Lou, this concept of being a challenger. Being strategic to me means getting there first, engaging early at very senior levels, having conversations about business problems, and then embedding yourself in a compelling business case in a way that creates disadvantage for the competition. You need to wire into the requirements, this document that will eventually come to market that the two of three are there to participate in will be wired against them because you got in early and set an agenda, especially around value. And the reason it's important to focus on value is because we all need to behave as if our biggest competitor is not our traditional competition, our biggest competitor is do nothing. We need to think, what happens if the customer has other funding priorities, if things change within their business? How can I be absolutely confident that they will go ahead? Because as much as buyers want their ROI and it's expensive for them to go to market and buy things, in big, complex sales environments where there's nine-month, 18-month sales cycles, it's very expensive for us to sell to them. So what I came up with was this concept called RSVP selling. Not really a sales methodology, but a framework for thinking about selling. And some of the things we've heard today is that coaching is dying. A, sales managers don't have the bandwidth. They're more administrators and spreadsheet jockeys these days more than anything else. What we really need is to mentor people and get them thinking and acting the right way. So what I'd do is every time I would sit down with a salesperson, whether it was with their account plan, with one of these sales tools, or whether it was on the back of a napkin in a coffee shop, I would say to them, tell me about the relationships that you've got in this account. And tell me about the relationships our competitors have got in this account. 
And the reason I do that is because the cardinal sin of selling, because relationships are foundational to any sales success, the cardinal sin of selling is that people are often selling to the wrong person or at the wrong level inside the organisation. They're selling to the people that can say no, but not to the people who can say yes. One of the problems with trying to project value to somebody, talking about all of your features and functions, A, features and functions can create price concerns because people think, well, that's probably over-engineered for what I need or it's going to take a lot of effort and complexity to implement. The other problem of features and functions is they don't win you deals, they exclude you from deals. Because when you start focusing on features and functions, you can often reveal something you don't have. You can highlight weakness, so it's a mistake. And when you're selling at a lower level in the organisation, the people you're talking to want to talk about those things about your product. When you go and sell at the right level, when you have relationships with genuine power in an organisation, when you can challenge them, you can talk about delivering business outcomes and managing risk. They're really the two things to focus on. Now you're going to get traction in the account and you're going to get sponsored down. More about that later. But I would say to them, tell me about the relationships you have in this account and are they relationships that are going to cause us to win this piece of business? Are they relationships of integrity? Do the people who have relationships do what they say they will do for you? Do they deliver you genuine insight and influence and give you intel about what's going on? That's the measure of relationships. The next thing was strategy. Do you as the salesperson have a strategy for managing these relationships? How are you going to avoid getting blocked? Are there external consultants that have got relationships that can influence in here for us? So what's your strategy in managing relationships? And what's your strategy for dealing with the competition? Number one competition is who? Do nothing. You've got a strategy around business case value. And that really leads into this concept of unique value. Not are you projecting a unique value proposition, that's very old world. That's what marketing departments in the 80s taught salespeople to do, feature, function, advantage, benefit, keep projecting all of this value out there. Rather than projecting value, do you know how we can uniquely create value for the customer with what it is that we offer? And first and foremost, by having a better understanding of their business and their operating environment than anybody else that's going to turn up and try to sell them. So that was the third thing. Are we uniquely creating value and getting embedded in a business case so they go ahead, they don't stall? And then the fourth thing that I you know, concluded was very important was this thing of process alignment. The reason most salespeople miss their forecast numbers is because they don't understand the buyer's process. They forecast based often, if they're men, on their own testosterone fueled needs to hit a number at the end of the financial year or the end of the quarter. Or they forecast based on when they think they're going to get a decision. But they don't understand that after the decision there needs to be a legal department involved in a contract review, it needs to go to a board, there's all kinds of other processes. Often the lower down people in buying organisations, if our salespeople are engaged at that level, will inadvertently, I won't say lie, but they'll mislead our own salespeople because they themselves don't know all of the gates inside their own organisation. They may not know that the funding is not really secured. They've only got to go ahead to actually go and investigate. So do we have strong process alignment? Are we aligned with the way that they evaluate and select and then we do we understand the approval and procurement process? And I talked last year about this concept of closed plans because that's how you can get process alignment. And you sit down with your buyer, the senior person in the organisation, and you don't talk about the date that they're going to place an order on you. That's transparently self-serving and it's not the end game anyway. If you're a challenger sales professional, you're talking about the date that your customer is going to be live, in production, realising the benefits of the solution you're delivering to solve their problem. So what date do they have to be live by? And then what happens if that date's missed? Does someone very important not receive an annual bonus? Does someone lose their job? If those things are in play, I think now we can start to forecast with confidence because the customer is telling us why it's important to have this in place by date. And once we've got that date, we can start to go backwards to all of the events that feed into going live. When do they need to assemble a project team? When will they need to have contracts signed by? And now what we've got is a date that you are going to get a purchase order based on the customer's need, not based on our need as a seller. And we get accuracy. So this concept of closed plans can be done very simply in a spreadsheet. Uh, there's lots of simple tools for doing that. So this concept of habitually saying to salespeople, tell me about the relationships you've got, what's your strategy, how are we uniquely creating value, and show me you understand their evaluation, selection and procurement process. Prove it all to me. 
having that conversation over and over again regardless of which tool you use or no tool because this is very low overhead. This is a conversational way to keep mentoring your people relentlessly so that they start to think that way. I had the managing director of a company uh, phone me from Hong Kong very excited one day. He read my book and three months later he was walking down the street after a coffee shop meeting with his number one rep in Asia and it had just dawned on him that he was using that process but he didn't realise he was doing it. He uncovered some serious areas of vulnerability and the person thought that they were home and hosed in the deal.